Thank you so much, Steve. Um, is the screen share showing up? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, first, let me just say uh, how appreciative I am and honored to be talking to you all today. This is like really coming home after spending six months at home. Um, it's really not home until you see your in-group community. Um, so I'm delighted to present with Nashir, contractor, but also uh, with all of our graduate students, undergraduate students, and collaborators who are listed on the slide who've been part of this. Um, and all right. Um, so to get us started, we really have two agenda items. Um, so we're going to share with you some work that we've been doing that was not intended to be about teaming in the time of COVID. It was really about intended to be about virtual teaming. Um, and of course, the whole world decided to embark on this experiment. We want to address two things. One is, what's the new normal? And by the new normal, I mean what we're living in right now. So COVID-19 has dramatically affected teams everywhere and how we're working together. And we're going to take an inside look at that. The second is we want to speculate and take, get some early data indicating what the next normal might look like. Um, and so with that said, do you remember when? Do you remember when teams were just teams? When the challenges that we looked at in teams looked more like this. Um, this is an example, the Mars Exploration Research Program. Um, the team includes all of the individuals you see at the bottom of the screen, and also these two adorable uh, robots that were sent to Mars. This is a team made up largely of geologists, and one of the grand challenges was sending two robot geologists to essentially do all of the field work in a discipline that prides itself on being rugged in the field and in immediate um, touch with the data and where they're collecting samples. Um, so this was a radical uh, challenge in distance. Another extreme challenge, um, how do we address issues where leadership is not preordained? So the Paris Climate Accord, who controls and has authority over reducing carbon emission? Um, this was an example of 200 world leaders coming together and informally uh, forming a group to address a grand challenge. Another one that we think a lot about, how we're going to ultimately live on Mars, um, perhaps without uh, global pandemics. Nashir and I and our talented students have been working with NASA and various space agencies thinking about this problem. And we had always hoped that some of the insights that we get from sending teams to Mars would certainly make life in teams on Earth a little bit better. Um, we had no idea that the time would sort of be now. So one of those challenges I want to put squarely in our focus today is the challenge of working in teams using digital technologies. In the backdrop of all of these NASA challenges, um, there is technology, but we're seeing technology in an entirely new way. So many of us uh, in, in our Zoom room here today have all been engaged with thinking about teams and technology. And we know that virtual teams have become a norm before COVID. Uh, they cause, uh, they enable people to work together who are geographically separated. They allow more diverse groups of people with different cultural backgrounds to come together. They combine specialization, which is distributed, and they allow us to respond to a hyper-competitive uh, speed to market environment. On the other hand, they have some assets, right? Or so we think. So uh, trends towards digitization, miniaturization, the high-speed the high internet, personal computing, social networking, and teams. We're really good at this. Um, so certainly we could capitalize on the, these advantages. Um, technologies are cropping up everywhere. So even before COVID, many of us were dropboxing and slacking and teaming and yammering and sales forcing and and Google driving. And we had these technologies on our little handheld devices. We had them uh, on our enterprise systems in our various workplaces. And so the technology was everywhere. In spite of this, no, none of us uh, were certainly of the impression that virtual teams was a solved problem. So there are certain known challenges for virtual teams. It's difficult to build and maintain trust. 
it's hard to communicate efficiently, um, to develop the transactive memory needed to do so, to have a shared understanding, um, sustaining motivation across distance and time, and how to optimally leverage these technologies. Now I want you to imagine, one day, some 32,000 employees stayed home. They weren't sick or on strike. Employees ranging from the CEO to phone operators were part of an experiment that involved 100,000 people. Its purpose? To explore how far a vast organization could go in transforming the workplace. Sound familiar? Um, this is actually a 1998 Harvard Business Review article on alternative workplace arrangements. Um, the graphics uh, are probably a little bit amusing. This isn't quite what it looks like in 2020. Um, but interestingly, um, this is not a new question, right? So now it's no longer an experiment uh, with 100,000 people. Do you want me to take over, Leslie? Please. Okay. Well, today what we face, of course, is a, a, is a large-scale beta uh, test. I like to say that we, we couldn't do what IBM was experimenting to do. That itself was kind of crazy. But today we're actually facing a worldwide, um, global, um, at the same time, contemporaneous beta test of what the world would look like if we were to experiment with virtual teamings in that particular context. Next. And again, this is just a recap, not that any of us need to see this, but obviously it's clear that we've been dealing with a lot of really amazing uh, episodic events, each looking redder or darker than the other in terms of the outbreaks, in terms of the number of deaths. It looks such a long time ago when the US was lamenting on the New, when the New York Times was lamenting on the front page 100,000, an incalculable loss, uh, year when we have crossed double that amount already and uh, with no sight, no end in sight in the near future, et cetera. So what happened then is that we wanted to take advantage of this. Um, I come from a city close by to a city uh, that was once, uh, the mayor was Rahm Emanuel and Rahm Emanuel is notorious for saying that never let a crisis go, go to waste. And so that's pretty much what uh, gave us the opportunity to try this experiment here. As Leslie mentioned, it started innocuously uh, be prompted by an article that uh, Paul Leonardi, who's one of our collaborators on this project, uh, and I published in Harvard Business Review in 2018, where we talked about the fact that uh, one of the challenges of using social networks uh, in the workplace and trying to understand its effects is that it's very difficult to collect social network data um, and it gets out of date very quickly and it's also fairly expensive to do. Um, and so what we were arguing in this article is it would it be possible for us to take digital trace data and see if there is a way to predict what people would have said on a social network survey by just using the digital traces of data that they leave. So that was the original motivation for the article. And uh, it started with a couple of companies, but today we have data on five companies in the United States and China that we've been collecting data from. And um, what we have tried to do is to understand how we can now take that data that we by chance began to collect last year in 2019 and now continue to collect data on those companies uh, through the crisis and hopefully post uh, COVID crisis as well. I'm only gonna talk about uh, one particular company. It's a multinational industrial manufacturing company in China. Uh, we collected data from three departments from 185 employees who, who are located in 34 offices in uh, 16 uh, cities. There were 18 teams within this group and they were across both within and across cities, et cetera. If you look at the data, the data for the, that we collected, that we're reporting on here, we actually collected data going back to the spring of last year, but the, uh, the data that we're gonna report here is data collected between October 2019 and up until March of 2020. Now notice this is in China, which was hit by the, by the COVID a little before we were. And so in some ways we are beginning to see not only the old normal, the new normal, but we're getting a sneak preview of the next normal because as you'll see in a couple of slides, China has already come back to a lot of the workplaces. If you look at the timeline out here, you will see that um, the first, uh, the awareness of COVID hit on the 11th of uh, January. 
in this particular organization, employees began to leave the offices on the 4th of February, which also in a sense coincided with the Chinese New Year. But instead of returning as they would have, they were asked to stay home for a little longer. And then the phased return began on the 17th of uh, February. So if you look at the next slide, then what we are seeing here is that we, we decided to bin this, these uh, episodes into four phases. The first was the normal working phase that went from October till January 10th when the awareness of COVID started. The crisis looming phase is the one that we label for between 11th Jan and the 3rd of, uh, of February. Um, the shift to remote happened on the 4th of February when they came back from the Chinese New Year holidays. And, they, uh, and that continued until the 16th of February. And then the phased return in, in this particular organization, and indeed in, in most of uh, Beijing, Shanghai, and other cities in China, uh, began on the 17th of February. So what we, uh, we are using the labels, as I said, the normal, the new normal, and the next normal. And one of the things that I would just, we would caveat here is the next normal, this may be a preview of the next normal. We may not be quite ready for the next normal yet, but at least we get some chance to see what happens when people go back to the office and to what extent is whatever we call the next normal similar or different from the original normal or the old normal. Uh, we've seen in, in um, <clears throat> political discussions and economic discussions, uh, the metaphors of are we going to have a U-shaped recovery or a V-shaped recovery or a swoosh recovery, which is the Nike logo where it went down a little bit but came up even higher, et cetera. And that is part of what we are going to be sharing in terms of what we have found out here in this particular context. So if we go to the next slide, we look at the timeline here of the actual coronavirus cases. And again, just to give a sense of where the awareness happened, when they began to leave office, and as you can see, the, uh, the phase return calibrates well with the decline in the confirmed new cases, as well as the decline in treatment and the recoveries, et cetera. So uh, in, in general, uh, unlike perhaps what is going on in this country, in China, this was orchestrated quite well, et cetera. In terms of number of days, um, 66 workdays from the normal working, nine workdays during the crisis looming, nine during the shift to remote, and 20 in the actual work days about it. Well, it would not come as any surprise that one of the things we were doing, given the original motivation for the study, was to collect network data. And so one of the things we did was we had both survey data as well as digital trace data. The digital trace data that we are using out here is uh, collecting data on who meets whom from 184, 185 employees in the company and the ties that we look in this that I'm, that I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides was actually digital trace data of who met with whom on a Zoom type of channel that they were using. Uh, obviously, these can be meetings such as this one, which right now has 98 participants. We wouldn't consider this as a real meaningful one-to-one -one interaction. And so we followed the dictum that if the meeting was above seven, it would not constitute a, a direct tie between those individuals. It turns out that by truncating it at greater than seven, we still accounted for 92.97% of the meetings. What we lost was the all hands meetings where they had a discussion for everyone else in the context, et cetera. So now to see some pretty pictures. Um, if you look at the networks and as we scroll through it, uh, if you go to the next slide, we see the normal working uh, where you can see these 180 nodes and they have some amount of connections. Now remember this, to be careful that this is not a an organization that does not communicate this is just showing you who had at least one meeting digital interaction on any particular day. So it, this particular slide actually is looking at, uh, at data from uh, one particular day within, the, within that period. Uh, in this case, it was the 3rd of December that they were looking at. If you go to the next slide, this was collected on the 15th of January. So you see who are the people who are involved in meetings and you see some small clusters, et cetera. And then when we move to the 14th of February, it looks something like this, where there was a shift to remote, and now you begin to see slightly different configurations, et cetera. And then finally, if you come to phase return, this was data that was collected on the 21st of February when people began to come back. Now, one of the, uh, one of the uh, criticisms that I think is very justifiable about looking at pictures such as this is that it's, it's, um, it's eye candy. Uh, it's very difficult to squint at this and come up with any meaningful results. And so in order to do that, if we go to the next slide, we began to see how does this network structure change uh, over time? And before we go into the change of the network structure itself, 
um, we can start by talking about how many meetings with how many people for how long. So this is more descriptive stats on that particular topic. And Leslie, are you ready to take it away? Absolutely. Um, so this is an orientation to the graphs. I'm gonna start on the left side in the normal working period. As Nashir mentioned, the data is collected every single day. And so the dot is the average within that period, um, which gives you a sense of the trend. Because it's, a, it's an average of days, you also see what the minimum value was and what the maximum value was. That's what the blue and the red line are. So if we look on the left, we see just in terms of how many meetings are happening, before, during the, what we're now calling normal working, there was the most variability in how many meetings. So one day might not look like the next. Um, as we went into the crisis looming and beyond, um, there's been much more consistency in what one day looks like after the next. And notably, if you look at the phase return, there's a 53% increase in the, and remember, these are small teaming meetings, right? So seven people or fewer who are getting on a circuits call um, and meeting with each other. The next thing we wanna talk about is how big are these meetings? So if we look at the normal working period, the average um, is three or four people on a meeting. Um, once the shift to remote work happens, now there are six people um, and then the maximum goes way up on the phase return. And that's where we start to see um, not only a lot more meetings, but a lot more really big meetings. Um, so one of the, the interesting contrasts from the old to the new normal is little meetings uh, where people are using this technology to using it with slightly larger groups, um, socially distanced, of course. Um, and one other finding while we foreground the networks is how long are these meetings? Um, so you might think, oh, once we have this shift, maybe we're, we're on more meetings, but they're, few, they're shorter, right? They're quick kind of things. Um, that's certainly not what the data suggests. Um, we see this progressively, progressive lengthening of meetings. So from a 20 minute um, to a 30 minute, partly perhaps a function of group size, um, perhaps also a function of uh, other things that happened when we shifted to remote, the lack of shared context, um, taking longer to get people on the same page, an increase generally in the uncertainty of the work that everyone's doing, um, given the context. And I'm just going to call it uncoordinated distractions. Um, our children and pets and significant others and Wi-Fi outages don't all happen at the same time. So we, we certainly do a lot more of this. Let me get you caught up on what you missed. Okay, so next we, uh, having got that global sort of descriptive statistics on the duration and the size of meetings across the four phases, uh, let's uh, dive a little more into what are the patterns of communication that exist within and between teams uh, and over time, et cetera. So if we look at the next slide, now that Leslie has already given you some orientation on how to look at the, at the curves that we are going to be uh, talking about today, um, so uh, in this particular case, what we're looking at are the number of dyads, that is a number of ties amongst connections, amongst people for, for meetings that had, uh, that were less than, uh, through meetings that had uh, less than eight people. So seven people or less meetings, et cetera. And what we see out here in this particular graph is that there was the, the old normal, the normal working, uh, there was not very much of a change, though there was a slight dip during the crisis looming. And then that spiked up to almost the same as it was in the normal. And now what you see is that the people are just having a lot more connections. In other words, what this is showing is that on average, people are being are given to, are having meetings with a lot more people. That's the number of ties increasing. And that has gone up again significantly in the phased return. So what we see again here is uh, the fact that we are now talking to a larger number of people than we did in the, in, uh, before, uh, not during or before the crisis, et cetera. So in the old normal, there were 63 dyads that were teaming up on any particular date in the, in the organization. Uh, and in the next normal, in the phase return, there are 98 dyads. So that's a significant increase in the number of people who are pairing up now uh, post-normal, et cetera. For the next slide, we are looking, this was of course just looking entirely in the organization. For the next slide here, we are gonna to try to distinguish between the amount of communication you have within your team and outside your team. So given that we have an interest to see, does, this tech, does the crisis 
uh, make us focus much more internally into the team? Or does it now liberate us from our team and make us go outside the team? And so if you look at the, uh, an index in networks that was first popularized by David Crackhart from Carnegie Mellon, he talked about something called the external internal index. And this basically is a metric that says that if you, it gives you the ratio of how many of your ties are external versus internal. The formula is deceptively simple. Um, simply looking at the number of external ties you have, subtract from it the number of internal ties you have, and then divide it by the total number of external and internal ties. So if you look at the EI index on the next slide, we can see that it varies quite a lot over a period of time. And if you go to the next slide, you begin to see that, I, I should mention on this slide that the uh, if the focus is external, you start going towards a score of one. And if the focus is completely internal, that is if you're completely siloed and you only have all of your interaction within your own team, then it goes towards the uh, minus one score. So you basically have a situation where um, higher values means you have greater external focus compared relative to internal focus and negative values means you have more internal focus rather than external focus. So if you look at this, we see that pre-crisis, there was a slight external focus. So obviously zero means it's balanced and you have a slight external focus. That external focus uh, stays in place um, for during the looming crisis. But as you go and shift into remote, you see a remarkable change. It swings below. So in other words, what this is saying is that now during the crisis, you're circling the wagons, you're focusing much more on internal communication, so much for all the pipe dreams that the technology now liberates you from your team and you can talk to people outside. Indeed, you're doing exactly the opposite. You are staying input, you're staying within the uh, team and you're hunkering down. And then if you look finally, it comes back to the, on the phase return, you're now again creating a fairly good balance between the external and internal focus in this respect. If you go to the next slide, what we are now saying basically to summarize here is that in the old normal, there was an external focus. In the new normal during the crisis, there was an internal focus. And now in the next normal, as you have the phase return, you are recovering to a new balance between the external and the internal in this particular case. If you go to the next slide then, we ask ourselves the question, what degrees of separation existed amongst members within this organization? So again, remember the network tie is being defined here as who you have meetings with. And then the question is being asked, to what extent are the people who, uh, on average, what are the degrees of separation between any of the 285 employees that through meetings? Obviously this becomes important because if you think of how message gets transferred, it is through these degrees of separation. And um, of course, made famous in the studies by Stanley Milgram and since then on the six degrees of separation. In the normal working environment within this 185 employees uh, that we studied, the de average degrees of separation on any good day was 2.95, though it ranged all the way from 1.4 to the proverbial 6.009 uh, degrees of separation. Uh, that dipped a little bit and uh, during the looming, but came down even more during the, uh, the actual shift to remote work. So paradoxically, as people were now engaging in geographic distance where they were working from home or living at work, which I will be your preference for that phrase, uh, the fact is that that geographic distance was actually associated with network closeness. That is the degrees of separation between pairs of people shrank when people stayed home as compared to the previous one. And if you look further, then that basically says that as we came back to work, the geographic closeness when we came back to working together again in geography, that actually then reverted to greater network distance. So this is an interesting paradox between geographic distance and network distance in this particular context. If we go to the next slide, we see again, we look at the number of ties within the same office. So previously we were focusing on within the same team and between team. Now we are switching gears to talk about within the same office, because remember some of these teams were across offices and across locations across cities. Um, and so in this particular case, we see that before the crisis, a third of the meetings were with those who were in the same office. However, we see that as we moved into the remote work, uh, they were two thirds of our meetings are with those in the same office. So you again, in a sense, see the same hunkering down idea that as you began to move into um, focusing, on, um, focusing on the crisis, not only were you talking more within your own team, 
but you were also talking more within your own office. So this sense of circling the wagons is again visible in this, uh, in this particular slide, et cetera. So if we go to the next slide then, again, just to summarize here, two thirds of virtual teaming is among those who work in different locations in the old normal, while in the new and next more normal, two thirds of virtual teaming is among those who work in the same office. Um, the next set of slides, I'm gonna talk about something that is of great interest to people who are interested in doing social networks, and that is to what extent are these changes that we talked about and that we see at the max, at, in terms of magnitude, how do we see the extent to which these network changes is actually helping us broaden or deepen our networks? That is, to what extent are we drilling down and talking more to the same people that we talked before? To what extent are we talking to different people? And to talk about these uh, slides is to think of it almost in terms of uh, the concept of churn. That is, to what extent are the people that we talked about previously the same people, or are we now dispensing with the old people and talking to new people? And it brings up this idea, the metaphor of creating ties, maintaining ties, and dissolving ties. And to talk more about that, uh, Leslie, do you want to take things away? Absolutely. Um, so one of the things we did, this is kind of building on uh, this idea of are we talking to people who are located near us? Um, is looking at the network reports of people saying, who are your close contacts? So these are people that in the survey data said, this person is somebody that, um, that I interact with in person. And before the crisis, um, two thirds of those in the online meetings are people that you don't report interacting with um, in person. So they're not in what you call your in-person network. Um, and we see that changing and by the, the shift to remote period when everybody's at home, it's really replacing in person. So now 54% of the people that we're meeting with in these small online teaming meetings are people that we report are in our close uh, interpersonal network. And then if we look at the, sh the shift to remote work and we compare the 36 to the 51%, it doesn't go all the way back, right? And again, this is an early look data because China's a little bit ahead of us in terms of the phased return to work, uh, which we hope to someday have. Um, but we noticed in China, it didn't go back to the way it was. And we think that some of these trends towards it's not going back, right? It's not that we just sort of had this suddenly turn on all the social media and everything we're forced to use these tools, we, it kind of points to this idea that people might be emerging differently. Um, and so I wanna kind of just foreshadow that. So the old normal pre-COVID-19, about two thirds of remote teaming is among your prior in-person contacts. Um, and afterwards, it's about half of remote teaming is really augmenting in-person contacts. So you're not using it to bridge distance, but you're using it to add another dimension um, to relationships that um, we're all teaching hybrid. It's like teaming hybrid um, with a face-to-face -face component and an online component. The next thing we wanna do, building on this idea of churn uh, that Ms. Shear was talking about. So here we're talking about who you're meeting with, but one of the really nice things about this data is there's a time element to it. So when you meet with somebody, we know the meaning or the significance of them in your life. Are you, have you ever met with this person before? If not, then you're creating a tie. Maybe it's somebody that you used to interact with, but you haven't talked to them uh, for a whole period. And then we could call that reactivating a tie. Um, or maybe you have talked to them recently and we could call that you're maintaining a tie. And then on the other hand, maybe you did talk to them, but you're no longer, right? And so that would be you're dissolving a tie. And so one of the interesting ways to look at this churn idea is to look at the creation, maintenance, and dissolution of ties in the organization um, using this external internal ratio. And so here we're extending the concept to look at the degree to which your quick teaming relationships, so going into these um, small meetings, are creating, maintaining, or dissolving, and are those activities oriented more externally or more internally? Um, so first, let's start on the left. So the red line here is no longer the maximum. The red line is the dissolution of the ties. Who are you willing to let go of, right? So who do we drop? Um, and if we look at this, the red line is always above the zero line. And so what that means is that in general, 
there's an external focus to dissolving ties, right? So people who are outside of your team um, are, you're more, you dissolve more external ties than you let go of the internal ties. Now, if we drop down to the blue line, that's who do you maintain ties with? So these are people you met with them in the prior period, you're teaming up with them again in the current period. Um, that's the blue line. And then the purple line is the creation of ties. So these are people that the entire previous period, you were not meeting with them, and now you are, right? So this is, this is new uh, teaming relationships that are forming across phases. Um, notice that both the blue and the purple are below the zero line, right? And that's important because that says it's an internal focus. So while you're okay with letting go and dissolving ties more externally, the maintaining and creating ties tends to have more of this internal focus. Now, of course, you'll also notice uh, the middle of the K <laughs> uh, function for the blue and the purple. They go in opposite directions from the pandemic. Um, so I'll switch here. So the dissolution becomes a little more balanced during remote work, um, but then it reorients towards external at, during the phase return. If we go to the blue line, maintenance of ties is becoming more balanced, okay? So pre-pandemic, um, it was much more internally focused and it's coming uh, and sort of approaching zero. So we are maintaining, uh, interestingly, ties between teams even after the phased return to work. Um, and then the purple ties uh, or the purple line and the ties that are reflected by the purple line, um, this is a really strong, powerful internal focus. So when people are spending energy creating ties and again creating, um, these are ties that were not there in the prior period, um, those tend to show a much uh, more internal focus. And I should mention that there are always many more possible ties outside your team than inside your team. So there's a different base rate there and that's controlled for in this analysis. Um, so this is looking at probabilities relative to the number of people that are inside your team that you don't have a tie with, right? So opportunities and then people outside your team that you don't have a tie with. So it's always controlling for that um, base rate. So what can we take away from this? Um, there's this really interesting um, shift in terms of broadening and deepening. So in the old normal, there was this um, deepening, right? So the focus on creating intra-team as opposed to inter-team um, ties was certainly there. During the phased return, we're seeing an even stronger tendency towards deepening um, over broadening. And that's also especially interesting coupled with the finding Nasheer showed about the path length um, and looking at how even though there's lots and lots more meetings in that last period, the meetings are getting larger, the characteristic path length, so how far do I have to walk a piece of information on average to get it to somebody else um, that, you know, it, it's born in one team and I want it to travel to another team, that actually is getting longer um, and perhaps partly borne out by this tendency to emphasize um, deepening over broadening. And so this invites us to remember when, um, and I wanna use, just indulge me in one Italian reference. So uh, Giovanni Boccaccio in 1353 um, wrote a book about the plague and it was the 1348 pandemic in Florence, and he captured lots of little short stories about what life was like. And Giovanni's idea was pretty simple, you know, as a humanist at the time, um, he was saying, you know, these plagues happen, they wipe out, uh, you know, a third or half of the world's population. Wouldn't it be nice if we could learn from them, right? So everything from, you know, how to get on with your family, how to get food, how to, um, perhaps drink a little bit more wine. You know, this is kind of an account of how, uh, how, to how one would live happily through a plague. Um, and so this has kind of been our philosophy in this project, in this work. And it's kind of our call to action to all of you, right? Let's make this matter. Um, when, you know, what's our Decameron in group? So when we come out of our plague of 2020, what will be the legacy? What will we be able to equip virtual teams 
um, high performing sep geographically separated teams to do that we were struggling with uh, before this pandemic. So in closing, yeah, um, yeah, you know, there's already been some discussion. Uh, Joe Allen and Christopher Weiss and others have been discussing in the chat about what happens uh, when we can go back to work. And I just wanted to leave you with this uh, projection by Pricewaterhouse Coopers PwC that came out in June. Uh, and the results here would show us uh, somewhat, um, somewhat surprisingly that what somewhat unsurprisingly the number of people who are going to be anticipate working remotely at least one day a week is very, very high during COVID. But uh, surprisingly for some people, it's going to be, according to this projection, it's 55% even post COVID. Now, obviously this is their projection. There has been a lot of debate amongst organizations. Uh, companies like Google and Facebook have told their employees that they can be working from home for at least half of, or maybe all of next year. Uh, some have been told they don't have to come back to work at all. Uh, others have projected that uh, this might have, uh, again, an, a disparate effect in terms of office spaces. Uh, there was one study that came out that said, well, this is going to really hit retail off, uh, office spaces because people are not going to need that much place. Uh, but there was another co counter study uh, that was also proposed by uh, Schmidt from uh, who used to be the CEO at, at, at Google, which said that actually office space is going to be more of a premium because people would need to have greater spaces for social distancing amongst people who are working in the office. And as a result, they would need actually more space, not less space for offices. And so office space might go up as a premium, et cetera. In, if you think about the next slide, then I'm still not convinced, we are still not convinced that it is that we are already at the next normal, even in China. And I think that, again, judging also from some of the comments that have been made, uh, Jessica Wildman, for example, talks about whether we really think that uh, what this connection and this broadening and deepening has to do with social connection as much as coordination of actual work, trying to make sense of what is going on here. Um, I think a lot remains to be seen. I think we, what I think we can agree on is that work is never going to be the same again. The beta test, the global beta test that I alluded to at the start has going, is going to leave us with certain lessons that is going to fundamentally change how we think about this and what exactly that next normal is going to be. Uh, is it going to be a trend towards more and larger meetings? Is it going to be deepening as opposed to broadening? Is it going to be um, virtual teaming finally happening from overcoming distance to not only being something that takes care of a problem, but actually being not a bug, but a feature for augmenting teamwork? And these are some of the questions that I think in-group and in-group scholars from around the world uh, should be uh, addressing so that we can stay ahead of it for the, for the next stage, et cetera. So with that, I think we're going to close it. I want to give special props to uh, the two, two graduate students who have worked tirelessly in terms of all of the analysis that we presented here. Uh, Brennan Antone, who's a PhD student in industrial engineering and management science, and Jasmine Wu, who's a PhD student in uh, media technology and society program that is out of the School of Communication here. Uh, also props to um, Carmen uh, Chan, Arshia Srinivas, who, who also actually did many of the visuals that we are seeing out here. And also our colleagues at Fudan University School of Management, uh, Calvin, Yunji Calvin and his PhD student, Hui, and our other collaborators, Michael Johnson, who's here, Paul Leonardi from Santa Barbara, and Jackie Lane, uh, who's a postdoc now at HBS. So thank you all very much for giving us this opportunity. Um, we, we've really uh, enjoyed our opportunity to share this for the first time, actually, with the in-group. Uh, no one else has seen these results. Uh, hint, hint, they were not ready until quite recently. Let me just say that. And uh, I'll stop with that. Thanks again. So um, thank you so much, uh, Anashir and Leslie. Very, inter very interesting, fascinating. Um, you can see through the chat box how much you, uh, thoughts you generated. Um, uh, I s we have a few minutes left. Um, we can address questions by putting them in the chat box or if anyone wishes to speak up. Any questions for our, our, our speakers? Ashir, I think you were monitoring the chat box. Are there any questions that popped up in there that you want to uh, uh, elaborate on? Leslie, you too. Actually, any questions I've, you want to touch on? Steve, I've got a question. Um, that I'd like to, for, so 
one of the things that we're not seeing or, or that people are struggling with is kind of lumping meetings all together. I talked about the task and actually Ninja just made a similar comment. So I'd like to know, do you guys have any insights on uh, things that can't be done um, over, you know, uh, technology? Has anything emerged that, you know, these are clear limits and we're going to need co-location for this, but maybe not that? Well, I, I, I can I can go first, and then Leslie, I'll give you some time to come to come up with a thoughtful response while I banter before you. Um, I uh, clearly, Matt, one of the things that uh, this is uh, the type of tasks we're talking about right now that can be done virtually are obviously skewing towards knowledge workers. The moment you have something that requires physically people to be together, anything that involves actual, you know, the work that involves physical interaction. Uh, that is obviously going to be something that is, you know, what we are calling essential workers in some cases, et cetera, today. Uh, those are all uh, categories that there's no doubt that working purely in a virtual environment uh, will not be able to accomplish many of those goals, at least not till we have robots that can remotely do many of those surgeries and so on and so forth. So I think we definitely have a, a limitation in, kinds, in the kinds of tasks we are looking at out here and the kinds of issues. Um, and it is, uh, and I and I think your point is really well taken, and and also Ninja. That is, we really have to uh, put brackets around this, and these are very early uh, at efforts at trying to look at some with very broad strokes that doesn't take into account exactly what you said, Matt. So I wanted to add two things. I think that is really the million dollar question, right? And one answer. Um, so this comes not from actually um, the data that we shared today, but. Um, in my experiences, I think I've taught four courses remotely now, team leadership courses. And it's been painful, painful, painful. And then I've reached this point where I'm realizing, oh my God, this is so much easier um, once it's adapted, right? And so there's actually a lot of things where um, you can teach teams and you can teach about the development of shared cognition and they can watch it as it unfolded and you can replay it for them. And so there are a lot of things that I think we, we will be able to do better. The one, um, that, the one that I'm seeing that we can't is related to Steve's point about being president um, for the first time during the pandemic. And Steve, I wasn't totally shrugging responsibility because I took over department chair um, during a pandemic, um, which is an awful time to do that. And I think the deep relationship work um, you know, people are struggling right now in their lives and it, we can coordinate work. We can make Google Docs. We can have meeting. We can move tenure and promotions through. We can um, help students. But there's been a lot of pain and suffering this summer with the social justice crisis, the, the way the pandemic's affecting our lives, um, people's professional identity being, you know, really threatened. And um, every day, you know, there's not a day that goes by that I do not feel how much harder it is to um, be present for people in the way that, that we all need it from each other um, through a technology. And so I think to some extent, there's, I'm very aware of that um, just in, in trying to be a chair um, in, a, in the middle of a pandemic. So I wonder if, if some of that, and again, it's not that you can't do it, but things that would be so much better in person, um, you know, I just, I don't feel that the, that the best Zoom meeting with a one gig connection and an eight, a 4K camera, um, it's just not the same as human presence. I see there's some comments in the chat that I agree with. Uh, I think uh, Marissa made a couple of points, Jessica Wildman, about some kinds of teams that have to do physical work. And certainly I know that a year at uh, Northwestern, my appointment in, is in part in industrial engineering and management science and the engineering school has been hit very hard for all the kinds of prototyping, uh, engineering design, senior capstone projects that they do, which um, is, is very difficult to do. And um, to go back to Matt's point, I think there's, there is, we don't have a solution to that right now in terms of- Can I, can I ask Ninja uh, to ask his question that was on Hoover? Cause I think it's pretty, pretty interesting. Oh, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Michael. So I think uh, the question that I was having is, uh, I mean, given that technology on the one hand is a leveler, there's also differences in the extent to which people have access and uh, different people may have 
different kinds of restrictions to whether they can show up in a restrictive workplace or not. Uh, so I'm, I just wanted to pose this question more gen generally that what kind of inclusion and coordination challenges do we need to be thinking about as uh, teams researchers? Yeah, I, I, Ninja, that's a fantastic question. And by the way, it's, this is not the first time we've had to deal with that, but it is again uh, giving us another opportunity to engage in that. Every technology has created this sort of, sort of paradox that uh, everyone, everyone might get a little better, but there are certain privileged people who get a lot better. So going back to theories of communication, mass communication is called the knowledge gap theory, the rich get richer, et cetera. Uh, in our present parlance with our fascination for uh, the alphabets, we have in addition to the B and the U, something that is called the K, which is referring exactly to that, that is saying that some people are actually doing worse and other people are doing better. And we see that in, at least I know, I'm sure that you've experienced this, that uh, I think today our community, academic community is clearly divided between those who might actually find the current circumstances really conducive to being productive and healthy and et cetera, uh, because we have technologies to do with it. And on the other side of the Zoom screen, I often see uh, 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 colleagues who, because they're caregiving, because they're living in small confined environments, because they don't have good access to technology, who are actually the down scope on that K that I talked about. Uh, but studying that in a systematic fashion, again, this is what I think is so fascinating about, about this particular opportunity, that as much as it's a crisis, it gives us an opportunity to answer questions that we couldn't possibly have answered at scale prior to this. And uh, we need, I mean, that's the best thing we can make out of this crisis is to do that. Just, I know we're about to end, but I just have to say, it is so thrilling to see so many of your live video feeds uh, miss being at the conference. And it's really, I'm just, it's so glad. Some of you I haven't seen in a really long time. Some I've seen recently. So I just, I'm just, it warms my heart to see all of you again. So May Leslie, I did you want something? to respond to Ninja's question or no? No, I just want to add on that I agree. It's so great to see everybody. And I want to especially thank the board because I don't think there's been a harder working board anywhere than the one that just um, took the spirit of in-group and its founding values and brought us together in this way. Um, and so thank you all. Albert, did you want to say something? Well, uh, I wondered, uh, besides, of course, the tasks that are involved, I wonder if uh, these things also are a matter of time or relative frequency. I would assume that many people would want a personal meeting every once in a while to build relationships, to affirm relationships, to affirm trust, to socialize joke together, have a glass of wine together, whatever. And as soon as that basis is there and maintained through some kind of regularity, then uh, online meetings often are in many ways much more efficient, mm. but they can't function without that personal affirmation every once in a while. Yeah. Thank you for the comment. Um, Anita has posted in, in, the, in the chat box that those of you who want to stick around, at 11.15, we are starting our first session on emergent states. So um, I welcome, to, I welcome all of you to that one. Uh, and Joe Allen will be, with his co-facilitator, will be uh, running that. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Nashir and Leslie, for stimulating uh, uh, talk. And um, uh, we'll look forward to more of these kinds of discussions. So have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.